Welcome to a little update on uh, on the progress of uh, Copenhagen suborbitals this week. As you can see, it's a bit uh, chilly in the workshop. It's uh, a couple of degrees be below zero in uh, Copenhagen these days. We just had a huge amount of snowfall, but that doesn't prevent us from working in uh, the workshop, even though it's uh, cold. Today, we're going to look a little bit around and see what the different people are working on now and where we are on the different things. So the past few weeks, I've been looking at the uh, data we generated with the BPM2, the BPM5, uh, and uh, it turns out we have actually uh, run a total thrust, a total accumulated thrust of 700 kilonewton seconds with the uh, about 35 static tests we performed on those engines. And uh, I've been looking carefully at the data, and I've also started looking into the DPR system on the Nexu rocket and calculating different scenarios for. Uh, how, uh, how high Nexu 2 will fly with various DPR uh, scenarios. You know, we can vary how much gas and how much propellant we load the rocket with, and that gives us a, a range of, uh, of apogees that we can hit, depending on uh, what we choose in the end. Welcome back to the rocket shop. Uh, I'm just going to show you a little bit about what I've been fiddling with uh, since, since, uh, since you saw last time. Um, we have a whole lot of projects going on right now and we actually started up some new ones just to be ahead of, of reality when, when it strikes us somewhere around the summer where we need to be uh, working with a brand new BPM 100 engine. So, but more on that later. I uh, just want to show you right now what we're doing. Um, we've got the Nexu 1 rocket lying right next door and it's, it's com almost complete. We just need a few tests and it should be ready to fly. We are doing uh, the Nexu 2 rocket now as a main focus and uh, with this pallet we have down here is one of my uh, favorite pallets. It contains a lot of the uh, almost uh, prepared materials and components and parts. We need to put that entire Nexu 2 rocket together. So, um, and there has been a few uh, well, improvements or uh, modifications from the BPM-1 uh, rocket. Uh, even though it haven't flown yet. Uh, one of the things we discovered during the, um, during the cold flow test of the Nexu-1 rocket, we had it uh, attached to our dummy launch rail outside and we filled it up with, uh, with liquid nitrogen just to make sure there was no fire hazard. Uh, and and the, the, the liquid uh, nitrogen behaves very much like liquid oxygen. So it's, it's a pretty good com comparison. And we had the uh, entire styrofoam insulation on and so on and so on. And then we let it sit there on, I think it was more than two hours on the launch rail, and just let it cold soak. The uh, liquid nitrogen was evaporating from, from the main fuel tank all the time. And it did, the fuel, uh, sorry, the oxidized tank became very, very cold. And we, s we observed something a little peculiar when, when that happened. We saw the, um, the temperature sensor in the engine controller box located in the engine section uh, displaying a temperature inside the engine controller that was steadily dropping. And that was even when the engine controller actually generates a little bit of, of heat by itself. So what basically happened was that the temperature dropped and dropped and dropped inside the engine section and we went well below the freezing point. Uh, uh, over those two hours and, and, and we discovered afterwards that the entire engine section was, was basically over iced. We had ice everywhere. That is partly due to the way we have constructed the Dexu-1 rocket. It's made out of, uh, of sections with uh, standard flanges that we can bolt together, a modular uh, concept where we can uh, build a rocket almost in any uh, configuration. But it also has the effect of very large uh, heat transmission surfaces. So the entire oxidizer tanks go very, very, very cold. And all the aluminum attached to that, uh, to that tank starts conducting heat away from the engine section primarily. That's why it over iced so much. And, and these uh, um, uh, solid aluminum profiles we use as, as uh, structural beams in the engine section. Of course, when they're solid aluminum, they are also excellent heat conductors. So we had a undercooled uh, engine section and it's so, actually it was so cold that we started 
uh, worrying a little bit if, if it had to sit more on the launch rail with, uh, with uh, liquid oxygen for more than two hours. So we came up with a, with a small uh, countermeasure and uh, we actually got this. It used to be a square-sized fiberglass um, uh, plate and it's uh, just about a, a millimeter and a half in thickness. And um, uh, well, a lot of cutting and a good deal of patience later, we suddenly have this insert, which we are going to, uh, to sandwich between the engine section and the oxidized tank. Now, uh, fiberglass have some pretty bad heat conduction uh, characteristics. So we're actually hoping to insulate uh, the Indian section uh, quite a bit from, from, the LOX, uh, from the LOX tank. This should hopefully help us maintain a much uh, higher temperature in the Indian section. But, um, but we simply have to go in to see how, how this works out. Uh, the fiberglass itself is, is very, very rigid and stiff, so there is no chance of us uh, squeezing or cracking it when we bolt the rocket sections together. So this one will, will hold up just fine. Uh, we're just going to have to see exactly how much heat this one allows to, to flow between the different sections. I don't believe it'll be very much, but we're probably going to have a cold uh, soak test later anyway maybe during one of the uh, one of the big rehearsals but uh, we're going to 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 stick this one in between the two sections and then we're going to see how much uh, we have lowered our uh, our heat conduction problem uh, we are about ready to start uh, making the new cable harness for the next two rocket um, Though we are not sure about the length of the rocket yet, because the DPR section of the rocket is not fully designed yet, so uh, our mock-up is still positioned here, not assembled in any way, but we will do that as, as we get the, the final design uh, numbers from uh, the rocket mechanics team, how long the, the DPR section are going to be. We're still in the progress of, uh, of renovating uh, our, our great big uh, autoclave here. Um, we have just uh, gotten a new electronics guy and uh, we're putting him through the paces uh, by having him uh, construct uh, all the, the software and uh, not software, the hardware for, uh, for controlling our autoclave. Uh, and once we get it up and running, we will be using it for, um, for production of uh, composite materials, uh, for instance, uh, nose cones, uh, heat shields, uh, stuff like that. But uh, there's a fair bit of work to be done in, with regards to getting it, it finished. Uh, the entire control system on it uh, was unfortunately missing, which means we have to rebuild it from scratch. And uh, that's going to take some work before that is finished. Uh, but we hope to get it up and running within the next couple of months so that we can start producing uh, carbon fiber parts for, uh, for the speaker rocket when we get to that. Um, we've also been looking into uh, to the first pre-preparations for the BPM 100 rocket engine. That's going to be a 10 ton thrust engine, so it's going to be the most powerful engine we have ever built so far. Right now we are considering two different ways of, of manufacturing this engine. Uh, one, of, one option is uh, ablative cooling, which basically means we are going to make a, a big uh, composite or fiberglass or carbon fiber or some kind of composite uh, structure, which is going to be the engine itself. There will be no cooling system in this engine with the exception of the uh, resin and the composite fiber itself. Uh, slowly burning and eroding away during the rocket burn. So um, we are going to have to, uh, to look into a few different uh, concepts on how to manufacture um, this kind of, of, of BPM 100 engine. Um, I've just been talking to a few different uh, suppliers. Uh, the, it, it seems to be that there are a whole lot of, uh, of rather temperature resistant uh, fiber composites out there and, uh, and equally many uh, high temperature resins. And I think we're going to have to do a small study uh, on, on the different uh, combinations because 
you don't have to look into very many products before you end up with a, a horde of, of different uh, combinations. Uh, some options can be ruled out immediately, but but you'll still end up, still end up with a, a number of, of, of likely plausible uh, different uh, combinations that you can use. Now, when we are talking about the, uh, the BPM100 engine, we are roughly looking at a scale like this. This is an old, uh, unfinished engine which is uh, now sitting in the museum but it, it, it fairly well gives the, the approximate uh, height and, and diameter of the system. The, uh, the contours are going to be a little bit different but that's beside the point. Um, if we're going to manufacture a, um, a composite engine in roughly this size we are going to have to upgrade our, uh, our composite uh, department uh, once more. Um, one of the major tools we are going to need for this kind of, of huge uh, composite engine is the autoclave that we are right now just finishing the refurbishment of. Uh, it's basically a, a huge pressure cooker and it can operate both with the vacuum and pressure and heat as well. So it's going to be a perfect uh, tool for, for, uh, for curing these, uh, these resin constructions. And, and hopefully uh, that will, will help us uh, get started with some, some, some small uh, experiments on, on how to do uh, these uh, com composite engines. One possibility, it's just a personal one I came up with yesterday or the day before, we might just want to start uh, doing some experiments with these uh, composite structures by actually building uh, a couple of different uh, BPM5 engines just based on pure ablative cooling. Uh, we already have the injector for it. We, uh, we know this engine very, very well. We have a lot of, of running data from it. So it's very easy to, to, to directly compare um, results and performance if we should decide to make a, a small ablative cool test engine uh, on the way to the BPM 100. But um, that's all in the air right now, and we haven't decided on anything. But we uh, we're a couple of people that need to go to this uh, to one of these suppliers uh, very soon and have a good long discussion with him about uh, the perfect combination of, of, of fiber and, and resin for uh, for a uh, huge ten-ton engine. The next test is uh, uh, a test of the interoperability of the radio systems on the Nexu 1 rocket. Uh, we want to make absolutely certain that uh, the transmitters on the rocket will not make it impossible for the GPS receivers to see the, si the signal from the satellites. Uh, in order to, to do that, we will assemble the, the front part of the rocket, the, that's uh, the avionics uh, section, um, with all the electronics uh, boxes, the parachute department, and uh, then the nose cone. And this front part of the rocket will be placed on the parking lot, and uh, we will uh, communicate with the, with the radio systems from inside, where it isn't as cold as outside, and see that um, the GPS receivers uh, get, uh, get data from uh, the GPS satellites in order to make a, a correct fix uh, of, of the position. This is the avionics compartment. Uh, I'm working on at the moment uh, for Nexo 2 rocket. It's the same as for Nexo 1. Um, it will contain um, all the electronics for the rocket, a radio uh, box uh, and a guidance and navigation box and uh, on the side uh, it will have uh, a power distributor and uh, the GPS uh, box. And in the middle, we will have uh, the batteries placed on the shelves. Yeah. Uh, 
Now, uh, in, in related to the BPM 100 engine, we have another um, another topic we need to, to solve, a problem we need to solve. Um, that's basically the ignition of this monster engine. So far, we've just uh, ignited the BPM 5 engine by using uh, pyrotechnic devices. Um, and that's not going to be enough for the BPM 100 engine. Uh, we just went over the uh, numbers, uh, me and a couple of other guys, and we uh, we were quite frankly a little bit stunned on on how much energy we are going to need in an uh, ignition system for a BPM 100 engine. It turns out that we need somewhere probably between two and five percent of the energy levels outputted by the BPM 100 engine, and that roughly translates to somewhere between 10 and 20 megawatts. That's a monstrous number, and it's just for an ignition system. So we're going to have to think this over really thoroughly because we might need a two-stage injection sy uh, ignition system. We need a 10 to 20 megawatt ig uh, primary ignition system to start the BPM 100 engine, but we might need an even smaller ignition system to just start the pre-burner. But, uh, but we have some different uh, theories on, on how to get around this, and we have some, some plausible solutions we need to check out. Now, 10 to 20 megawatts is basically uh, somewhere in between the output of a BPM-2 and a BPM-5 engine on full throttle. So if we can find a, uh, or build uh, and design, design and build a smaller ignition device, which can actually light up a BPM-5 engine, then we definitely have the first uh, ignition system ready. If we can get an ignition system uh, roughly comparable to a BPI, BPM-5 engine running, then it's a matter of implementing that system into the BPM-100 engine so that we can light that one up as well. So that's kind of an engineering challenge, a uh, pretty good one. Uh, so we're, we're going to, to, to really think this over and see how we can solve this one. It's going to be a really entertaining challenge. So that was a little update on, on what's going on in the workshop right now. We will be back shortly with, uh, with more updates from Copenhagen's of Orbital, so stay tuned. We have a, a little funny thing uh, that you may not know about. We have a, an ignition key for the rocket. Uh, that's a connector which we will place in the, in the connector for the charger uh, connector. So uh, this connector will be placed in the rocket uh, before takeoff and it should, as you can see here, uh, should be removed after we find the rocket again after splashdown.